thank uh, Abhishek Dhar and Sanjeev Sabha Pandit for asking me to come here. I hope you are still awake after lunch. Okay. Uh, I have been asked to give a series of talks on quantum dissipative systems. <coughs> So let me first ask uh, everybody, uh, have you had quantum mechanics? Would you, is there anybody who has not had any quantum mechanics, would you raise your hand? Okay. Uh, so everybody has had quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Now at what level, uh, are you familiar with Merzbacher? No? Yes? Yes, Messiah. So, what books have you read in quantum mechanics? Huh? Sakurai. Okay. That's good. Hmm? Shankar. So, what other books you have read? Sorry. You said something. No? Anyway. If there is something that I say which is not comprehensible, please stop me. So first of all, uh, what I would like to do is to also uh, relate what I say to some of the things that you have already seen in the first lecture and in the second lecture, wherever relevant. Let me first, however, uh, explain to you what I mean by dissipation, dissipative systems. So to that, I would like to take you back to some undergraduate uh, classes maybe and we actually used to do an experiment. I do not know if that experiment is still done in our BSc days where you would take a tall jar of water, very tall and so there is water here. So these are like sketches of water molecules. And what you do is that you drop a ball, assume it to be spherical, a solid ball through this water. So now temperature is fixed, pressure is fixed. Therefore, the entire system is in thermal equilibrium. Since some of the questions that come up earlier about meaning of equilibrium and non-equilibrium, we would like to make certain clarifications about those nomenclatures in terms of this very simple experiment. So what did you, what did we do that, you know, you drop the ball and you watch it under a microscope and you find that after some time the ball actually reaches what is called a terminal velocity, a steady state velocity. When the ball is, comes to in equilibrium with the surrounding water molecules, right. So the point I am making is that the water molecules inside the jar are indeed in equilibrium, but the ball by the very condition of dropping it has a certain initial condition on its velocity and therefore not yet in equilibrium. So this notion will keep coming back you know, over and over again when you would have a large system which actually is isolated and is in thermal equilibrium, meaning thereby that average quantities will be independent of time. However, you may want to look at sub and subsystems of this large system, like the ball is a subsystem which may or may not be in equilibrium. All right? Okay. So now let us write down the equation of motion of this ball. Since it is falling down under gravity, gravity was mentioned in the previous talk. So you write down what is the inertial force. So first of all, you have the gravitational force. Assuming the ball is spherical, you write the volume of the ball is 4 third pi a cubed times its density. So I have indicated by rho sub s, which is density of the solid ball times the acceleration due to gravity. And that would normally be the Newton's equation of motion, 
and that will be mass times the acceleration. So, th this is the mass times the acceleration, all right, and that would be like that is again the volume times the density is the mass times d v d t is the acceleration, right. So, m d v d t, m d v d t is m g, that is all I have written. Actually, fourth third pi a cube I am going to cancel soon. However, that is not the entire story. Uh, as you know, there is a force due to uh, what is called Archimedes, right, buoyancy. So, what is that buoyancy force? So, as the ball comes down, there will be a buoyant force. What is that force? Huh? Sorry? Yeah, you are, you are not supposed to answer. Uh, so, it is the weight, weight upward thrust, which is the weight of the displaced water. So, how much water does it displace? It displaces the same amount as the volume of that ball. So, you will have a minus 4 third pi a cubed. That is the volume of the displaced water, but now you have to multiply that by the density of the liquid, the water. So, let me call that rho L times G gives you the weight of the displaced water, right. So, you know in this case of course, you could have cancelled fourth third pi a cubed all through, right. And, but is there anything else? So far, Newton prevails, okay. Is there anything else? This is what actually we were measuring. Our experiment was to measure the viscosity of water. Eta the viscosity. So, where does the viscosity come from? Okay. So, as the ball goes down inside the liquid, you could imagine what is going to happen that all these tiny water particles, water molecules, they are of course, in constant incessant motion and that is actually called Brownian motion. Which we will talk about not just here, but Sanjeev Sahapandit is also going to talk about Brownian motion. So, they and this motion is due to the fact that the system is at a constant temperature T. So, every particle if you look at the water molecule, it is this they are moving in a random zigzag manner. Okay and they are moving in such a way that their mean square velocity, which is proportional to the mean square kinetic energy is actually proportional to the temperature, right. This is what you have learnt in classical equipartition theorem. So, they are going to bombard on the ball and the ball therefore, as it moves down is going to encounter collisions from the surrounding water molecules and there will be more collisions from the front than from the back, just because it is going down. Just as when you walk or you run into the rain, you feel that there are more raindrops coming from the front. Okay. So, as you have collisions of water molecules, here is the ball, there are more collisions from the front than from the back. As a result, there is an upward force on the ball and that force is what is called the viscous force. Okay. So, there is another negative term and how do you write that force? Has anybody seen this at all? It is Stokes force. It, it comes from what is called Stokes law. So, the instant the, the force opposing the motion of the ball is proportional to the instantaneous velocity of the ball. It has other factors like the radius of the ball and the viscosity of water. Viscosity is like friction, like you know we try to roll this chalk piece on this table it will eventually come to stop that is because there is friction between the chalk and the table. So, how many of you have seen this? Can you raise your hand? Why do not you answer when I ask? 
Okay. So now you do a little jugglery, and so you get uh, dv dt is equal to. Uh, so these two will combine. You'll get rho s minus rho l divided by rho s times g, and then you have some geometrical factor, so 6 pi and then you have three, so uh, <coughs> I think it's 9 by 2 eta over a square times velocity, if I have done my algebra correctly. Okay. So, this is the equation that you get. So, until this part it is all Newton's law and then you have an extra term here. Okay, right? So, our experiment was such that as the ball goes down and when it enters a steady state then d v d t is 0 in a steady state. So, d v d t is 0 and therefore, you have an equation where it relates the viscosity to something like 2 by 9, uh, 2 a square divided by 9 and you have the v steady state velocity or transient velocity times rho s minus rho l g divided by rho s and so we would measure the diameter of the ball by a slight caliper, you know the density, you are given the density of the solid and density also you can measure and density of the liquid is given to you and you measure the steady state velocity from which you calculate the viscosity. That was the experiment actually in our undergraduate days. Okay. Now, so this simple model actually tells you a lot of things a that this notion of equilibrium that was coming up in the last lecture also. See, there is no question that the entire system is an equilibrium. What you have done, you have injected something from outside, you have disturbed the equilibrium of the system. So, if you are riding on this ball, that fellow is not in equilibrium ordinarily, but when this condition prevails, it also comes to an equilibrium with the surrounding system. That therefore, this instantaneous steady state velocity will be governed by thermo equilibrium thermodynamics and that uh, will be a recurring theme in the context of dissipative quantum systems. Okay. Now, viscosity means friction, viscosity means that what is happening is that there is energy transfer from the surrounding part system to the ball and therefore, the system is is energy is not con constant and in that sense the system is dissipative. So, the simplest idea of dissipation that you see already in your undergraduate days. And the other point that you note is and that is an important point as well that if you look at this equation of motion, there is a fundamental concept called time reversal invariance. Newton's laws, Schrodinger's equation, the, the Hamilton's equations of motion, the Lagrange equations they are all invariant under what is called time tr translation. So, that is uh, time invariance implies that your equations of motions are invariant under the change of t to minus t. It is called time reversal. Now, when you reverse time, the velocity being dx dt position x dx dt, velocity will flip sign if you change t to minus t, right? but there is a d dt there. So, left hand side does not change sign under t going to minus t. However, this term will mess things up, this term will indeed change sign and therefore, a dissipative equation is not invariant under time reversal. It is not coming from microscopic considerations, it is something that you have added on. You have added on because actually you have modeled what the viscous force would be like. Okay. The viscous force being dissipative will always break time reversal invariance. However, this is a simple model where you have assumed that the viscous force 
is linearly proportional to the instantaneous velocity. It could have been more complicated. Okay. So, uh, the equation is still linear in velocity. However, it does not obey time reversal invariance. So, this is the simplest idea of uh, dissipation, a dissipative system and also generic, I mean embedded in this idea is a concept of Brownian motion. So, if you remember this Scottish uh, medical practitioner was amateur botanist in 1820s, he wrote a series of papers in 1826 to 1828 where he was actually doing the same kind of experiment except instead of a ball, he had pollen particles and these pollen particles were somewhat bigger than the surrounding water molecules and still on nano scale and therefore, in the context of nano science, uh, Brownian motion or diffusion is a very, very important concept, but they are let us say three orders of magnitude larger than the surrounding water particles. And what Brown saw was that these pollen particles, though the temperature and pressure were fixed, were undergoing incessant random motion, which is why they are called Brownian motion in, uh, in the memory of uh, Robert Brown. So, this was like 1925, 26, etcetera, uh, that sort of era. And then it took the world uh, something like 80 years when Einstein actually uh, gave a theory of Brownian motion. So, if you read Einstein's papers, you will see that he is not using any concept of non equilibrium or anything when he is talking about pressure gradient, uh, viscosity, etcetera. So, therefore, uh, I think you should all read that paper. Because some of the questions that came up in the morning session uh, would have answers in, in that paper itself. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, Sutherland, uh, what Sutherland did is see while Einstein was doing this uh, work, he uh, used a Stokes law and then he used also the Fick's law and there apparently Sutherland has also con had contributed, Einstein apparently was not aware of that. I do not want to get into all those complicated issues. Okay? I mean, I want to still stay simple and uh, you, you can probably take it to a research level problem also by doing all kinds of things, but let us uh, let us stay uh, very simple in that. Okay. okay, any question on this? Yeah. This one. I mean, it came from that. Uh, yeah. There will be a nonlinear equation. No, uh, yeah, v square. But you know, this. I mean, I don't know why you will say you will have v squared. Okay. So yeah, my, see this. this uh, I mean, there is no physical reason for bringing a v squared. There's a physical reason for why it is pro linearly proportional to v. Now, you see, uh, yes, sir. How, why is it dissipative? That, that's because, you see, the, if you look at the energy, it is not conserved. The ball is gaining energy from the surrounding through this viscous force, through the collisions of the surrounding particles. Okay? So, in that sense, energy is getting transferred. I mean, okay. See, in statistical physics, in the school of statistical physics, you talk about a subsystem and a surrounding heat bar. This is a miniature model of that, where the ball is a subsystem and the water bar, water jar is, is, is a heat bar. And there is energy transfer between the subsystem and the bath, and that, in that sense, the system is dissipated. Energy is not conserved. in this context, but you can have time reversal invariance, uh, time reversal breakdown 
even without dissipation. For instance, if you take a charged particle in a magnetic field, then the Lorentz force is V cross B and that actually does not have time reversal invariance, that equation. If you write down the equation of the charged particle in a magnetic field, m dv dt will be some E by C times V cross B. So, right hand side does not preserve time reversal invariance. Okay. But again, if you think of where uh, you know where the magnetic field has come from, if it comes from some current in some loop or something, then the global system will have time reversal invariance. But the way you write down the equation of motion that does not have time reversal invariance, but that does not have any dissipation. Okay. Just one other comment that in Professor Jayanta Bhattacharya's lecture, there were much many more complicated things. Uh, if you recall that there was this, uh, uh, he was writing down the equation for dv dt, I am not writing the vector here. Okay. And then you had this Galilean term v gra dot grad v dot 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 etc. Okay. Now, uh, this term is not here because I am assuming that the velocity does not have any positional dependence. The velocity is uniform, it does not have any dependence on the position. So, the grad term is killed. So, now if you have dissipation or viscosity over and above what Professor Bhattacharya was talking about, that will be an added complication which I, I guess you will talk about later on. This equation already is very complicated because it is nonlinear in velocity. That Galilean term that he derived today uh, is nonlinear in velocity. So, therein lies the, the hard problem of turbulence and, and fluid mo motion. We do not have that here. We do not also have a pressure gradient term here because I am assuming pressure to be constant. But when you put dissipative term along with the fluid equation, then you you will see that what what going to what's going to happen later on. Okay. All right. So so th this idea will keep coming back and forth, where uh, we'll talk we'll go from this equation to a much a, a little more complicated stuff. So maybe at this stage we also say something here that you see. Uh, the velocity of this ball uh, is actually a, a random process. Okay. Just as if you think of a Maxwellian gas, the system is in equilibrium, but if you tag a given particle, a given molecule, its velocity is a random process. A random process is just a second level generalization of the concept that you saw in the morning, which is called a random variable. When a random variable is also, if you attach a certain other fiduciary parameter like time. For instance, in a Maxwellian gas, the velocity is also a function of time. So, velocity itself is a random variable, but when you are also looking uh, attaching a functionality with regard to time, then it becomes a random function and a, or a random process or a stochastic process. We will talk about this quite a bit, stochastic process or a random process. And what do you mean by that? Now, suppose you have a deterministic function, f of x is deterministic. I mean, it could be x squared, it could be sin x, cos x, whatever. Let us say it is sin x, then you know that it goes like that. But you have a, if you have a random function, then a random function means that if you have uh, if you have one representation of that function, because you have an ensemble of such functions. So, you, you repeat experiments. So, if you look at the function as a function of time, let us say f of t, 
or the velocity as a function of time of, of a Maxwellian gas particle, then in one sample, you will probably, you will see this trajectory, let us say. Now, you repeat the experiment for a deterministic function, you will see the same functional behavior. However, for a random function, you see a, a whole lot of trajectories there keep changing from one experiment to the other. So, you have an ensemble of such functions and so you can do several things. So, this is your x axis time t. So, you can take a cut and you say well at a given point time t 1, you have several values of that function, this one, that one, that one, that one, etcetera. And so, you do what is called an ensemble average or what you can do is, you take this function and look at its time evolution and do a time averaging. So, you can do both and uh, there are situations where both these averages would give you identical results. There are all situations also where they will not okay? and we may have occasion to discuss those. So, uh, the velocity of a Maxwellian gas is a random process. It is also a Gaussian process in the sense that was descri described in the morning. Okay. So, uh, we will see how it is. So, V of t is a Gaussian stochastic process. Of course, you know that even in equilibrium, the equilibrium probability distribution already has a Gaussian structure uh, like this is now the one point function that Dr. Sanjeev Saha Pandit was writing down that P of V in equilibrium goes like there is a pre factor which is a normalization factor half m v squared over the Boltzmann constant times t. Now, this is the equilibrium, this is an asymptotic steady state form of a probability function which could be a function of time. And this, and in fact, we will discuss situations where the probability itself is a function of, let us say, it is a function of velocity and time. And when steady state like this obtains and the system goes into a thermal equilibrium, you recover the Maxwellian distribution. Now, this P of V and comma T will also be a Gaussian for uh, the Brownian motion problem. Okay? In the same sense, uh, as uh, was discussed in Dr. Savapandi's lecture. So, this is all about the introductory remarks about dissipation and now I talk about what is quantum. So, you see in all these, in this example, this ball is of course, a macroscopic object or even the pollen particles are macroscopic object. Water molecules are also described because of the temperature at which we are interested in describing these they are like classical objects. However, if you go into the micro domain and you think of uh, let us say an electron or a proton or a muon, all right. Now, those guys actually behave quantum mechanically because uh, you have something called the de Broglie wavelength. which says and this is this relates to wave particle duality of quantum mechanics. That every every object is a particle as well as a wave right and so the wavelength is given by what is the wavelength de Broglie wavelength. Are you? H by m v. Okay, very good. H by m v. So uh, this is the Planck constant. So now, smaller the particle is, you will have a large wavelength, which means that you cannot localize a particle in the quantum domain. Electron is the lightest particle that normally we will deal with in solid-state physics, condensed matter physics. So, electron as you know is a mass of 9 times 10 to the minus 31 kg or so, it is a very tiny particle 
and the velocity in some sense since the v squared average scales like temperature as you go down to very low temperature v will also become smaller so you have product of two small quantities so you have a larger rather large wavelength so the electron has an extended wave function actually very extended now proton is uh, about 1000 uh, 2000 times the mass of the electron the muon is about 300 times the mass of the electron so they also have extended waves and so the, their quantum laws would have to be applied because these particles unlike this ball cannot be localized a localized particle is also is a wave but it's a very sharp wave all right and so therefore you need to deal with the generalized versions of these equations in the quantum domain and that is what our lectures will be all about at least in the beginning. So, we will be talking about uh, dissipation in the quantum domain. You may ask uh, can you give us some examples let me just quickly give you a couple of examples and then uh, get into my lecture. So, for instance you could think of this is quantum examples you could think of a particle in a double well so a double well let's say is a symmetric double well like this and you have a particle here which could be a hydrogen atom or a proton okay now there are many there are some examples of that which we will probably discuss here it's also okay i'll tell you so now uh, if this was a ball in that sense of classical physics and you have a very deep well then unless you really kick the ball this ball is going to stay there right it cannot jump over the barrier of course if you jiggle it okay you give lot of temperature fluctuations you heat the system it is possible that the ball will suddenly acquire okay because random fluctuations will acquire enough energy to climb over the barrier and go down so this process is called thermal activation this is how evaporation takes place that even though the temperature outside Bangalore you know, in the here, here in Bangalore is about 30 degrees Celsius well below the boiling point of water if you leave a dish of water outside you will still lose some water due to evaporation and that is the classical thermal activation over this barrier. But if the temperature is low and this ball is actually not a classical ball but let us say hydrogen atom then uh, even then because it is an extended wave the tail of the wave function though it is mostly localized here the tail may extend to the other well and so you will say that there is a finite probability of finding the hydrogen particle there also and this process is called tunneling all right. So, given the ball was here in the left well if you let it go it will keep going back and forth like a quantum clock very precise that is a very coherent quantum motion however uh, let us say you are in a solid state environment in a metallic environment or something like that the hydrogen atom is like a proton stripped of its electron it has a positive charge and as it tunnels it drags the electron cloud around it and that electron cloud is like these water molecules here which will therefore impede the tunneling process and you will have dissipative quantum tunneling which will then be an example of a quantum dissipative process. Okay. Now uh, the other point that I would like to make is that the barrier is high enough then the, and if you study the trajectories of the hydrogen particle it will be most of the time 
either here or there. In, in more technical term, these are the two attractors of motion. Okay, so it'll be either here or there. So it's a it's a case of a discrete. The position of the hydrogen particle is a discrete random variable, in the sense that was mentioned in the morning that you can have a spin half particle which is either up or down or a coin tossing situa situation where your head or tail. So, this is this is a case of a discrete stochastic process. So, this mod problem will be mapped into a discrete quantum stochastic process and will be dissipative. Okay. But the other problem that I mentioned is that let us say you have this is another generic situation where you take a charged particle in a magnetic field, charged particle like an electron in a magnetic field, so and put them in an enclosure, each of these electrons will undergo cyclotron motion because of the Lorentz force, right. You know that uh, the, if, if you put a charged particle in a magnetic field, there is a Lorentz force and that, that causes spiral motion because the particle goes into Larmor processions and this radius of that orbit is what is called the cyclotron radius and because the particle moving in a circle is in always an accelerated state, it will radiate energy and that is how you get an accelerator or you get synchrotron radiation out. And now, so, you have such charged particles and they create because of their orbital motion what is called a diamagnetic moment. It is a very important interesting problem in solid state physics that uh, as you know that because of lens is Faraday's law, the diamagnetic moment opposes the direction of the magnetic field. If you apply the magnetic field in the let us say in the z axis, then the uh, induced diamagnetic moment is along the minus z axis. So, if you take a collection of such particles, you do statistical mechanics, an ensemble of such particles, and you ask the question, what is a macroscopic diamagnetism? It turns out that if you apply classical laws, then that is identically equal to 0, it's the theorem due to Bohr and Van Leeuwen. But Landau showed that if you apply quantum theory, then actually you get a finite answer because diamagnetism does exist. Bismuth shows diamagnetism. And we may have time to describe what will happen if you have dissipation into the diamagnetic situation where the electrons though they are far apart and they are moving independently of each other, they may bump into other electrons, they may get slowed down by phonons in the system, the lattice vibrations etcetera. So, what will happen to dissipative diamagnetism will be an example of not a discrete stochastic quantum stochastic process, but a continuous quantum stochastic process just as the velocity of a Brownian particle is. So, uh, this is something that we will discuss dissipative diamagnetism. So, with this introduction let me just switch on my laptop and uh, I have some things written down here which will help me in uh, structuring my lecture in somewhat more coherent form. But you, I can pause and ask you if you have any questions. What is called a Langevin equation, but still in the classical domain. So, think of uh, the same model that we had here. Now, the we are making another conceptual jump. You see, the ball is going down and the water molecules are hitting the ball at random. Okay. So, the velocity of the ball gets does get impeded by the frictional force, but the effect of the collision also has a completely random part. So, the frictional part which we had taken to be linearly proportional, remember we took a term which was linearly proportional to the velocity, this is called systematic damping. The collisions however are completely random, so the velocity is actually totally random and what you have done 
is a partial averaging over that random process. So here, there's some kind of time scale separation that you have in mind, uh, the kind of model that is written here. The time scale separation is the following. You see, if you now look at the time axis, there are very tiny times. For instance, the impact time. Remember, in your classical kinetic theory, there is something called the impact approximation, which says that the time of a collision is instantaneous. Now, nothing is really instantaneous, but it is actually very, very small time. That time is estimated to be something like, let us say, 10 to the minus 15 second. You are not concerned about that time at all. Then you look at what is called the time between collisions. This is the what is called the mean free time between collisions. All right. And furthermore, then you also have what is called the Stokes time, which is roughly given by the inverse of this friction coefficient. Uh, this is the dimension of frequency, as you can see. So, its inverse also sets a time scale called the Stokes time scale. So. So, you have this Stokes time scale somewhere here, then you have a mean time between two collisions tau c and we are actually looking at the dynamics in this regime. All right. So, in this regime, you are no, no longer worried about the impact time that is gone. This is what is called coarse graining in statistical mechanics. You are doing coarse graining in time now. Okay. And now, when you have done that, the, the random force has a systematic component, which is what is given here, where, which means that you have time averaged over many such collisions to attain this, and there is yet certain fluctuations left over, which you have not averaged yet, and this is what is called noise. Okay. So, theta of t is noise, it is also a noisy force. which yet has to be averaged over. Okay. Now, this equation is the generalized version of what I had written down before. You forget about all those uh, uh, Archimedes terms and the gravity terms. And we are also looking at simply one dimension, so that I have not considered any vector sign on the velocity, which will be inevitable when you look at fluid motion, because you go into rotation issues, etcetera. So, it is all in 1 D and so this is the simplest model of Brownian motion and it is called a Langevin equation also written down in the same year as Einstein's theory of Brownian motion that is 1905. So, I will first tell you the classical behavior of such an equation before you go into the quantum domain. All right. Now, some I mean I do not have to work it out, but you all see that th this is the solution of this equation. You know how to solve a linear differential equation, right, with an inhomogeneous term. Well, you check, we will check that, you know, what you are doing is that you are taking the velocity at time t equal to 0 to be v naught. So, at t equal to 0, this term is 1. So, you get v naught, this integral vanishes. Okay. So, that you have checked. Then, you have to check whether by doing, taking a time derivative, you get this equation back or not. So, you take dv dt. When you take d dt of that, you bring down a factor minus gamma. All right. But now, I guess, uh, you would have to know how to do this time derivative here. There are two time dependent functions here lurking here. You have e to the minus gamma t, you can bring outside and it has the same structure. So, you bring down a minus gamma and the rest of the term is again the velocity, which is what will give you the cis term. And then you have another de derivative to do, which is a derivative of an integral, which does depend on time because of the upper limit being t. And do you know how to take that derivative? Well, tutorial, right. I guess we cannot go into that now here. All right. Okay. Now, 
this is a purely random force. So, uh, remember the W of uh, Dr. Sabha Pandit, which is average is equal to 0. In this case, it is now the full ensemble average of the random force, which is that you take many, many samples of that random noise so, and the bar indicate that average. So, that, that is assumed to be equal to 0. So, when you take the average of this equation and there is a, an assumption of what is called stationarity, that stationarity simply means the following that if you do an experiment now and experiment later on, the result of the experiment should be the same, which means that you have time translation and that means that you can actually do the averaging inside the integral. So, when you do the averaging like with the bar of top, this term drops, drops out and so the mean velocity for that experiment that I was talking about will be from a, in any initial velocity v naught will be exponentially damped and it would go like e to the power minus gamma t, which is that first term. Okay. However, you have more interesting masala coming up now. Okay. Any, it's very simple, right? We are still solving something that we learn on our grandmother's knees, right? Solving linear differential equations, nothing more complicated than that. Okay. BSc mathematics. So, if I now take the average, this is what the average equation looks like. So, I, I think I should write down that equation again. Also write down the solution. So, V of t from any initial condition V naught e to the power minus gamma t plus 1 over m integral 0 to t d t prime e to the power minus gamma t minus t prime times theta of t prime. So, I want to explain in detail the meaning of equilibrium, non-equilibrium, etcetera. This equation definitely describes a particle which is not yet in equilibrium. Okay. Now, what you do is you take this solution and you square the velocity. You take v square of t. So, there are two terms originally. When you square it, you are going to get four terms, right? The first term would be v naught squared e to the power minus 2 gamma t, which is this term. Okay. And then there will be cross terms v naught e to the minus gamma t times this. Okay. However, when you do the averaging in the sense of the barring, since the averaging of theta is 0, those two cross terms will disappear, but you are still left with the product of this term with itself but you need a different fiduciary time variable d t double prime. Therefore, you have a double integral here and a bar going over the product of theta of t prime and theta of t double prime. Is it clear? It is an independent random process in this case, but uh, just an extension of independent random variable idea. And so, now you are looking at the average of the product of two independent random variables, let us say. I am using, using the same jargon as in the morning. Then, if they are independent processes, then the probabilities are multiplicative. So, you get them factored out and that is equal to 0, if t prime is not equal to t double prime. That is the theta of noise at a time t prime and noise at another different time t double prime, their combined average would be equal to 0, unless you are actually sitting on the same time that t prime happens to be t double prime, then in the sense of distribution, 
or Dirac distribution, you have a Dirac delta function times a prefactor nu. Okay, right? Because then it has to be non-zero. It is a spike. So that's the assumption. Yeah. I'm doing ensemble average now. So you stick that in here, and I leave it as an exercise. It's not trivial. When you do this double integral, uh, you have to be careful whether t prime is greater than t double prime or otherwise. And so I leave it as an exercise to you. It's a double integral. This is something that happens very often in also just ordinary quantum mechanics when you do something like interaction picture quantum mechanics. Uh, there's a trick of doing this integral, and you must do this yourself. Yeah. It's see, okay. I'm not averaging. Where am I averaged over time? This bar thing is not. Have I done it zero to t and divided by time and then take time t going to infinity? I've not done that. So why are you calling it a time average? It's in the same sense as you do ensemble average in statistical mechanics. You see, look at this equation. This is a random process is driving a velocity which is also a driven random process. So this velocity, I mean, when you had done Maxwell Maxwellian gas, your V was a random variable. What did you mean by saying that the probability distribution is e to the power minus a half mb square over kt? Have you ever thought about it? So you, you, what you have is that you see you have an ensemble of velocities. Different particles are moving with different velocities, or even a given particle at different times are moving at random velocities. So either you do a replica of the same system and average over, and you come up with an equilibrium distribution, which is e to the power minus half mb square over kt. So it's on the same sense. I'm not doing anything else than what you have learned in equilibrium statistical mechanics. Please, I mean, I I hope that this point is understood. Otherwise, there's no no point in progressing further. V is a function of theta. I call it a random process, but anyway, yeah. In the morning, Dr. Savapundit was given. Huh? Sorry. See, I may not, this t may not represent time at all, some fiduciary variable. Why, do not get hooked on to time. It may not be time. Velocity depends on something. Okay. So, now in the case of a, if, if you think of a, I, I, I want you to take take you back to your undergraduate days when you did a problem of Maxwellian gas. You have a large room at a fixed temperature. You say the whole system is in equilibrium. What did you mean by equilibrium? You meant that the mean velocity was equal to zero. The mean square velocity is a constant, but the tag particle velocity is not time independent, right? And if you now change the time, you do an ex you take a stopwatch and do an experiment later on. You don't know what the next velocity is going to be at a different time, because the process is random. Okay, so you therefore take a time slice, which is what I showed you in the beginning, and do an ensemble average over all those cut cuttings that you have, which are different representations of the same variable, same process. And that's the meaning of an ensemble average. So theta of t, which is occurring actually from the collisions of the surrounding particles, is also 
a thermodynamic variable in the sense of the it is like a, like in the sense of a velocity, but it's just a, it's a random force. And normally, you in an undergraduate days you don't look at this stuff at all, because you look at an average equation, that is, you look at the bar equation, and then then this term had gone away, and that averaging as I indicated implies a time scale separation. Okay. But now you do not do that, you unscramble that time scale separation. So, now you are looking at the full stochastic equation and so there are terms, different terms, theta of t is driving velocity and velocity is also driving position by the way, there is also another term here which is d x d t equal to v. So, there is a hierarchy of random processes here, x is going to be the slowest of them in you know in hydrodynamics that they are called the slowest variable which uh, you will have to finally focus on to. Einstein's diffusion actually deals only with x. Okay. Uh, are you talking to each other or you want to ask a question what do you want now? You are explaining to him. Okay. Any other question? Sorry, I should then uh, leave this here. So, what do you get? You get v square of t average is equal to v naught square exponential minus 2 gamma t plus nu times 2 gamma m squared 1 minus e to the power minus 2 gamma t. So, at this stage, it is like this ball experiment and when I was talking about steady state velocity, which means that you wait long, long enough when you, you reach a steady state where average quantities do not depend on time anymore. So, if you take now the limit t going to infinity of this equation, this term will drop out, this term will drop out and you get this term. So, that is what is there in the first equation. And if at this stage you invoke thermodynamics, you assume that your system which is a subsystem defined by its velocity v has come to equ equilibrium with the surrounding bath which is at a temperature t, then equipartition theorem applies and then v square of t average limit t going to infinity is k b t over m. Okay. And that, so this is what is here. So, you have nu over 2 gamma m square is k b t over m and you get this relationship and this is an important name in our business called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. It is called F d theorem. The reason it is called fluctuation dissipation theorem, if you remember gamma is your friction coefficient which connotes to dissipation. Nu however, was a fluctuation of the noise theta of t prime theta of t double prime was written as nu times the Dirac delta function. So, this is something these are like equilibrium fluctuations. Okay. Equilibrium fluctuations like register fluctuations or Nyquist noise when you have current moving in a uh, in a wire and that pre factor was nu. So, nu relates to fluctuations. So, fluctuation gets related to dissipation and so this this relationship is called fluctuation dissipation theorem. Okay. Now, you could have done something else also. Suppose you had said that, uh, now please listen, suppose you now do an ensemble average of v square over t, the full on the full ensemble average of a Maxwellian distribution, then v naught square average would also go like k b t over m, because even if you take any initial velocity which will get thermalized, v naught square average will go like k b t over m. 
So, you get a k b t over m here and if you insist on this plug this relationship then that term would cancel with this and you get back the same relationship. So, there are two ways of recovering equilibrium either you take time t going to infinity because you imagine that that time t is such a long time so much longer than the Stokes time scale that equilibrium has prevailed or what you do is you say that your initial velocity v naught is actually out of a random sample of a configuration of, a, of an averaging process and so that v naught square will also have to be averaged over. You put the k b t over m there that term cancels with this and the fluctuation dissipation theorem would ensure that even v square of t average will go to k b t over m. That will be a full average. So, this is still a partial average this bar is a partial ensemble average. What I am now talking about is a full thermodynamic average where you have removed this coarse graining fully and done the full thermal average and that will recover for you the equilibrium value of the velocity squared. Okay. Now, uh, a couple of things I, that I would like to now go through. So, that is number one. So, what we have discussed is how does the instantaneous velocity look like? How does the mean velocity look like that v of v bar of t was v naught e to the power minus gamma t? How does the mean squared velocity after partial averaging look like as a function of time? And how would the mean square velocity look like in equilibrium? Now, you want to look at what is called a correlation function. Uh, it was alluded to in the morning lecture. But suppose now you take v of t, the solution was written here and you multiply by v of another parameter tau where t could be either larger than tau or smaller than tau, we are not specifying it yet. So, again you take the product of two such functions. Earlier we were taking v of t multiplying by v of t to get v square of t, but now you take v of t times v of tau and put a bar. Again for reasons mentioned earlier, you will have two terms, but instead of two minus 2 gamma t, you will have now minus gamma times t plus tau and you have this other term the cross terms disappear for reasons mentioned earlier. And again you use the delta function representation of the noise and you obtain this result. Okay. I leave it here, please look at it and let me just copy it here so that we can refer to this thing. I go up to 4 o'clock. A little innovative whether you know, the integral uh, t prime is greater than t double prime or not to do these integrals. Okay. Now, this is this is called a correlation function because it correlates given suppose t is greater than tau, you may ask the question given that the velocity was v of tau at a time tau, what is the probability that is going to be v of t at a later time? and that is measured by the correlation function. Okay. You can relate these functions to the second moments, the cumulants that Dr. Sava Pandit mentioned about and you will see that if because the velocity will turn out to be a Gaussian stochastic process for Brownian motion, it is uh, cumulants have got very simple structure. So, now you had this this equation, now you do the now you take the limit t going to infinity. So, you are doing this full thermodynamic averaging, you have waited long enough you know everything has died down and system has come to equilibrium. So, when you take time t uh, sorry, so now when you do equilibrium averaging that means that 
this is the indicated by the subscript 0 and the angular brackets. Then v naught squared is k b t over m and so you have done this cancellation here and so this term has cancelled out with that term having so remember v naught square is k b t over m. So, this is precisely cancelling out with this term and you are left with that term and that is this term. If you assume t to be greater than tau. So, let me again say something here that this theta of t is delta correlated in time because this correlation function is a delta function in time because you assume that that is your the shortest time scale in the problem is the one associated with your noise variable. The velocity is a driven stochastic process. It is however, exponentially correlated with time. See delta correlation means that the moment you deviate from the time arguments and they take the time arguments to be different that correlation function was 0. Here you have to actually deviate by large extent t minus tau has to be much larger than gamma inverse when you lose that correlation. So, it is called an exponential correlated. It is also called something called like a Dube's theorem that uh, a one dimensional Gaussian stochastic process of the form given by the Langevin equation would have exponential correlation in time. Okay. And then uh, there are also uh, this statement that if you had taken limit t minus tau going to infinity uh, then of course, you will get 0. So, it means the following that here there are two time scales t and tau if you take that time difference also to go to infinity, then uh, the again it is a question of these times are so far apart that you will say that that averaging would imply that you can do averages of the products and each of these products is equal to 0. And so, you have recovered again the equilibrium idea by simply going to the long time limit. Uh, this, this result uh, this property is called the property of mixing. Okay. Mixing and ergodicity are two different concepts, which uh, I am not going to go into. I think maybe Dr. Savapandit will talk about it, right? You are going to talk about ergodicity. Uh, now, in, I, in, this, uh, in this next 10 to 12 minutes, I would like to provide you with a derivation of this equation that I wrote down, which is a Langevin model. It is a model, but you may ask the question, can we derive it? This derivation is important because uh, it shows how to make a quantum generalization to discuss the dissipative quantum system. So, this is what I will need for tomorrow's lecture. So, the way you derive it is a model due to Swansig. Swansig 1973 Stat Physics, Journal of Statistical Physics. So, where what you do is you think of again this ball that you had in mind when you were dropping it. But now, the Swansing model says that you imagine that the center of gravity of this ball is connected to the whole lot of springs with tiny, tiny balls, a whole lot of them and inf eventually an infinitely large number. So, this ball is wading its way through a liquid. Okay and this therefore, is governed by Newton's equations of motion or Hamilton's equations of motion. And these little balls are also moving, but they are not moving independently because each of them is connected by a spring. So, you start writing down a Hamiltonian for the ball. So, you are doing Hamiltonian mechanics here, where you have the first equation which is your definition of the momentum itself. 
So, q is a generalized coordinate. So, d q d t is p over t over m and then you want to derive a Langevin equation. So, your Hamiltonian has the kinetic energy term p square by 2 m. It may the particle may move in an arbitrary potential u of q and this is the term for these tiny little balls. So, now if you have a coordinate system with respect to which you are looking at the coordinate of each of these particles, if you call it the q j, that this energy of this particle is however, so this is capital Q. So, this distance is q j minus q and to get the spring energy you have to square it and that is what this term is all about. Okay. Actually, it is not quite this, but you can in fact make a normal coordinate transformation to write it in this particular form, which I may have it here, or may not have it here, but we can again do it in the tutorial. So, now let me point this out to you that the Langevin equation that I was writing down there, this term as well as the noise term, these two terms were added by hand like you do in a model. You simply stipulated these two terms. In this form so far, we have nothing like that. We are still, we are we're doing Hamiltonian mechanics of a many body system in which we have a central tagged particle with connected by springs with a whole lot of tiny particles. Okay? So, now you start writing down Hamilton's equations of motion, which is that p dot is d h d q q dot and uh, sorry p dot is minus d h d q and then q dot is d h d p. You do that. Okay, actually I have uh, this normal coordinate transformation where you can uh, you see starting from this model, you can actually, so let me also write this down, so that I need it to have half m j omega j squared little q j minus c j capital Q over m j omega j squared squared. Now, if you complete the square, you get half m j omega j squared q j square. It is like a spring energy for each of these tiny jth particle. Then you have another term which is half m j omega j squared c j square capital Q square m j square over omega j raised to the power 4 minus a cross term and the cross term you can see is nicely giving you c j q j capital Q and here you do some cancellation to get to C yeah. So, uh, so in, in this form you can see that what you have managed to get is a linear coupling between the coordinate of the jth small ball and the coordinate of the large particle. Okay. And this is something, this is like a quadratic term in capital Q, which you can subsume in your u of q term, the sum over all j, because there is a sum over all j. So, that is going to give you a constant term as far as the j dependence is concerned. And you get a capital Q square. So, it is like a parabolic term added to your u of q. So, it is a renormalization of the original potential energy but you have a nice coupling term here. That is the motion of capital Q is coupled to the motion of these little q j's. Okay? So, if you write down, start writing down equations of motion for capital P, capital Q, little p j's and little q j's, you will have these equations coupled. And the whole idea is for you to see how by doing a suitable averaging and you will see the meaning of this averaging shortly. By doing a suitable averaging over the QJL PJ small QJ PJ variables, how you can restructure your equations of motion for capital P and capital Q in the form of a Langevin equation. So, that is the task at hand. 
Now, uh, I, as I said, in order to visualize this model, uh, you may want to make certain normal coordinate transformations of the kind that is written down here. It's an exercise, and you actually can get an equivalent form where you can interpret this particular model as the displacement coordinate for little qj's from capital Q and the spring energy of that set of particles by also making a transformation of the mass. Forget about that. So, I mean, this, these things are not systematically written. So, this is just the linear, uh, the, the normal coordinate transformation to give you two different forms of the Hamiltonian, which are, however, identical. But now you go into the equation submotion. So, given the Hamiltonian structure, you write down the first equation, which is dq dt is p over m, just the definition of the momentum. And now you write the dp dt equation, which is minus del h del q, and that is the equation. So, you see P is like M V. So, I did not have an M here. I had it originally. So, D P D T is the same term as this term. We did not have an external potential energy term before. before so, you forget about that. Now, the question that you are asking is, how do you massage this term, which has no noise yet, how do you massage this term to make that term look like this term plus that term? So, that is what you are trying to do. Okay. So, please pay attention. We have not done any, we have not introduced any stochasticity in the problem at all. We are simply doing Hamiltonian mechanics, but just as the position and the velocity of a Maxwellian particle is part of a thermodynamic system your little q j's and little p j's are also going to be eventually made to be part of a thermodynamic system and suitable averaging done and you there you will see the meaning of ensemble averaging. There is no question of time averaging and how you recover a Langevin equation. So, it is a derivation of a Langevin equation. I need that to derive a similar Langevin equation in the quantum domain, which is what we will call it the quantum Langevin equation tomorrow morning. So, now having done the d q d t equal to p over m term. Now, you write down the d p d t equation. You have already done that. You write down d q j d t, which is again the definition of the momentum of the small particles and d p j d t. Because of the linear coupling, you get this displaced term. So, you could combine these two just as you do for a harmonic oscillator problem. All I am doing is simple harmonic oscillator problem. The mathematics is not any more complicated than that you plug this p j, you take a second derivative of q j, get d p j d t, you plug this equation and this is the equation of a harmonic oscillator. It is a displaced harmonic oscillator, coordinate is displaced by this amount and you know how to write down the solution of this equation. Obviously, you will get cosine and sine terms. So, what do you get? You get q j of t q j is a function of t in terms of initial values of q j's and p j's with oscillatory functions cosine and sine with the same omega frequency as the frequency of this each of these tiny oscillators and a term due to this coupling term where you have now actually coupled the system because q j of t is not independent of capital Q of t. So, in order to solve the equation for capital P where capital Q is lurking there you ought to solve this equation first. So, this is what you are going to do next. Okay. So, this is a solution for q j of t and then you have plugged it back into the p equation d p d t. Now, behold this equation has time reversal invariance is emerging out of essentially Newtonian mechanics. Okay there is nothing thermodynamic or statistical about it yet. It is just that I am now solving Hamilton's equations of motion of a large particle in interaction with a whole lot of tiny particles. The interaction has been assumed to be very simple harmonic. Okay. But, we would like to write, the, write this equation down in a suggestive form, which is like the Langevin equation except 
that we are not able to yet, we have a time integral equation here which has a structure of uh, what is called a memory function. So, this friction which was coming out of an integral as a constant now is, is an inside of an integral equation like a kernel which is zeta of t minus t prime. So, all I have done, okay, no cheating, everything is transparent. I have simply rewritten this equation and introduced certain notation. The notation is that zeta of t minus t prime is simply you read it out here from here is 1 over m summation j c j square over m j omega square cosine omega j t minus t prime. That is the definition of the zeta function. The definition of the theta function is this term within the curly brackets summation j averages. So, this theta of t a bar is equal to going to be 0 with this Gibbs measure of the probability function and lo and behold you will find that the correlation function of that theta of t will be proportional to that same memory kernel that sat inside the integral equation. So, zeta of t minus t prime let me remind you is the kernel in this integral equation. So, theta of t, theta of t prime by the very properties of the structure of these equations have led you to a form that the correlation function of this is given by the kernel itself, which is in essence the fluctuation dissipation theorem.